Hello and welcome to another episode of Making Nature Matter. So this is the first episode of a mini series that we'll be doing called Water, Bees and Trees. Um, here today I have Alice Castleman, or yeah, Castleman from Acer and Corey Harris from Ganaraska Regional Conservation Authority. Uh, Corey, would you mind introducing yourself and, and telling everyone who you are a little bit? Sure. Um... So my name is Corey Harris. I'm the Watershed Services Coordinator at the Ganaraska Region Conservation Authority. I've been in the role for about two and a half years. I'm an engineer uh, by training, specializing in water resources and watershed management. Um, and yeah, here at the GRCA, we're focusing on many things. We, we wear many different hats, um, everything from natural hazards management to source water protection, um, forestry, forest management, watershed management, there's a whole bunch of things, but uh, uh, I'll leave it there, but uh, happy to answer any questions as we go through this. Awesome, thank you. And uh, and Alice, could you give a little bit of an introduction right. as well? Thank you. Uh, my name is Alice Castleman. I was a teacher of science in high schools for my career and working in outdoors with TRC and other uh, network bound and places like that, environmental educators. And what I've done uh, just before I retired was set up ACER to be able to develop materials for teachers and other group leaders to um, take on getting their kids outside and have providing resources and be able to do that and do good activities that are useful to everyone could be shared. And so uh, there's a bunch of programs now that we've developed and put up on the website for people to uh, in, take part in or lead in their own community. And so we've been planting trees and measure uh, for since 2008, 2002, pardon me, and schoolyards for 2008. And uh, before that, we started inventorying forest biodiversity, international plots, putting them in in Ontario and measuring trees to find out what changes they were, impacts we were going to have on uh, our forest from climate change. So it's been a uh, finding the needs uh, that people for data to be able to mark and measure and report and make it matter uh, in all the different ways we can figure it out, whether it's one tree in your yard or a forest, one hectare plot or anything in between, working with communities to make that happen and vol train volunteers. So you have 13 conservation authorities, for example, who put in one hectare plots in their forests and or riparian zones because we're worried about the water going into the lake and erosion on the, along the watershed. So um, lots of different programs developed, always for the community needs now are more of a focus. So we're looking at helping companies, uh, particularly nurseries that have um, a collection of native trees and grow the seedlings for planting out, uh, trying to train people and as interns uh, for universities and colleges to measure and inventory the trees on their campuses and other kinds of things that, um, that are helpful to the community to get, reconnect with nature and break down barriers and biases and yet get trees in the ground. So our, our really our hidden agenda is to have people understand more about science and feel comfortable talking about science and things, understanding and be able to work together to get the data and enjoy each other's company while they're doing it. <laughs> And that's kind of the hope of this as well, is just to have uh, people get inspired and and, uh, and join along. Um, for those who are listening, who um, who are will be inspired or who love trees and water, um, would you be able to give a little bit of a background on your education and you know how you got to where where you are today through your journey? Well, I think I begin then in a small town in eastern Ontario along the St. Lawrence River and the, joining the Girl Guides. Brownies and Girl Guides got me outdoors with a group, uh, although I visited my relatives' farms. And so uh, I grew up uh, learning to get along with other people in the camp and so on. And then when I, um, at Queens, there was an ecology club. We started with our biology majors. And after that, um, I got into helping um, canoe tripping and, and uh, Killarney Park and so on. 
uh, is this something I'd like in the summer because I didn't want to stay in the city for the summer. Always was outdoors in the summer. And so then um, help get us, uh, we're bound to establish in Northern Ontario and working with uh, setting up the Council of Outdoor Educators for Ontario, COEO, and Environmental Educators of Ontario. I like to get in the front line and help people get things pulled together to get the established uh, organizations and get them published or active and doing good work. Um, and then, um, I started teaching uh, overseas uh, and I was working with students there in German high schools and they all had a um, place in the country where they took their kids once a year to do a week or so and I realized that we should be doing that. So that's part of how we got outdoor education going here in Ontario. And I did that with my students, taking them away for a week or at a residential outdoor center or something like that for some time. And then, um, I realized that when I was teaching science, there weren't Canadian resources for the teachers to be able to, to do things with their students that are Canadian. And the publishing company was companies in Canada and Ontario were very difficult to break through with science texts. You had to produce hard covered copies in order to be reviewed, imagine. So anyway, um, I decided to start Acer as a birthday present to me when I was 50. So I've now been at it for quite some time and enjoying developing more and more programs that meet people's needs and enjoying meeting and working with a lot of young people like yourself and other interns. And uh, so it's been a really um, uh, an interesting journey to be able to start with nothing and build, you know, what equipment lists and buy the equipment, source this, get the contacts going, all the things as a startup that we have to undergo and try to find the funding. And, and that's still going on only at a larger scale. <laughs> with a lot of part-time people working here and there and still writing proposals and still doing some administration, although I'm trying to share the load and pass it along. <laughs> Succession planning is part of our, my project. <laughs> so okay. that's where I'm at, but I do enjoy meeting with, on the Zoom calls with all kinds of interesting people, <laughs> helping them along, helping them along, sharing my experiences. And you, Corey? Uh, well, my journey, I guess, has some similarities um, in terms of the seeds that uh, Alice had shared. I, I also was in uh, the scouting movement as a kid and spent a lot of time outdoors. And I've always appreciated the outdoors and, and camping. Um, I guess that led me <clears throat> to pursue uh, education and ultimately a career in the environment. And I picked engineering, uh, rightly or wrongly, <laughs> because I felt you could have an influence in your community in terms of how the community uh, was designed and uh, you know, grew or, or changed over time and, and have a, a direct impact on, impact on people's lives. But I think a turning point for me was having a summer job at the uh, Ministry of Natural Resources out of Elmer District. And I met this fantastic gentleman by the name of Dave McLeod, who uh, was the district ecologist for that office. And he knew all of his birds, his, his grasses, his sedges, his trees, his plants. He knew all his birds by sound. And I was just completely um, changed by meeting this man. And uh, it, it also opened up the side of conservation and, and the role of conservation and land use planning and um, you know, working with landowners to take care of, of their land. And uh, I was originally gonna go into pollution abatement, which is a very important field, but I, I was just really drawn to the conservation side and focused my studies at, at the University of Guelph in the areas of um, water resources and uh, stream, uh, like studying streams, like channel morphology and, and the modeling that goes behind figuring out how a stream functions. Um, that ended up getting me a job at uh, the Halton Region Conservation Authority back in 98. And I just progressed through a number of different roles there, everything from dealing directly with landowners on general inquiries to uh, helping you know, try to keep people safe you know, by building their homes out of the hazard, the flood and erosion hazard. 
um, dealing with illegal dumping and trying to get those areas cleaned up and, and restored. And um, that parlayed in, into stormwater management and land use planning and, and seeing how the planning process worked and how um, you can play a role in that and, and have an impact on, on communities as they grow and, and um, develop in an intelligent and, and resilient way. So, um, so I've spent almost 20 years there and I, I was witness to the 2014 Burlington flood, which I think oh. folks have probably heard. <laughs> I was the acting coordinator of the uh, uh, water resources section there at the Conservation Authority. And just to see uh, the impact of a significant event on that community was, um, it was another milestone because it just showed, you know, the decisions, the planning decisions that were good and the planning decisions that were not good. <laughs> you know, the stuff that we've done to our creeks historically, um, it really showed up when a storm like that comes through. So um, I think going through that and then making the move out here into this, this school as the coordinator of the watershed management team, it's just been a really nice progression of, um, I guess, just changing roles and, and becoming um, more involved in the, the watershed management work at the higher levels. So um, yeah, it's, I think watershed management, it's not well understood by a lot of people in Ontario, but it is so very, very important, especially now when we're talking about climate change and building resilient communities. It's, it's pretty important. Would you be able to kind of give a quick uh, like summary or definition of what watershed is, what watershed management is? Sure. Well, I think most people know what watersheds are, but if they don't, I'll just briefly describe it. The watershed is basically the drainage area for a creek or river system. So when rain falls on the ground and it goes one direction towards the creek, that defines the watershed boundary for that river or creek system. And you've often heard the term watershed divide. That's where the flow splits between two, two watersheds. So watershed management is a, um, it's, it's not a new idea. It's been around for a long time because that was one of the main um, foundational building blocks of the Conservation Authority movement was managing land use and um, you know, water on a, on a watershed basis. So what someone's doing upstream is not having a negative impact on them downstream. Um, so I, I think today we, we have much more or many more tools to, to look at testing and, and assessing the health of the watershed. Um, and that's culminated in a watershed study, for example. And those studies will engage the public and the communities and, and we can plan for identifying what are the issues in the watershed, where do we want to go in the future, and what kind of input and role do you want to have as a, as a watershed resident. So it's a really holistic way of looking at how you manage your land for the, for the best um, possible uh, use and enjoyment of your community. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, Alice, do you have a question that you would like to ask? Well, uh, yes, a, a question, not really a question, sort of a comment. Okay. I think, uh, it might be worthwhile mentioning that <clears throat> the Conservation Ontario became really a viable entity after Hurricane Hazel. And so the 36 watersheds in Ontario were defined. And so they're managed by, by those Conservation Authorities over each watershed. And there is a big divide, you mentioned divide, and, and uh, if you look at the map of Ontario, there's streams and rivers running into Lake Superior from Northern Ontario and those live flying or <laughs> flowing to uh, James Bay. So that's a big divide for Ontario. <laughs> but I wanted to comment on, and, and, and just feel very comfortable with Corey because uh, when he was speaking about watershed management and land use management, my thoughts immediately went to the Repairing Rangers program with 13 conservation authorities who were planting a uh, thousand trees ever with grants we got from the province and uh, putting tags on 10% so they could go back and remeasure the success of their choices of sites and, and species of trees. 
And so uh, a watershed management through tree planting is now becoming more popular um, the last while because the extreme events like the Burlington one and some others locally uh, have led people to understand that the channeling, the hard channeling uh, and gabion baskets and concrete have been swept away by extreme events. So the old engineering philosophy that you can handle the water successfully has really taken a beating. And now they're paying big bucks to go back to nature, naturalize these slopes into the water courses and plant trees. And I know TRCA has been undertaking that because I've been working with them for about five years, tagging 10% of what they're planting each year. And so they're actually changing their methodology uh, on their mass repairing rangers plantings because they found out better ways of, of, of getting success and, and saving money by what they planted, how they planted, how they maintain necessarily watering only uh, or not, but mostly choosing eventually where they would water because they knew the site better and um, using summer crews to do uh, weed whacking so that they would have no competition uh, the young trees are no competition. So they mulch heavily and uh, tag 10%. And now um, I have uh, access to the video we had made by the woman who's in charge of the field work for those plantings and her boss, Vince, I've worked with for over 20 years and now he's, he's the big boss over this kind of thing. And so I feel very much uh, at home talking with Corey, speaking with Corey, because I think we could work together to get some riparian plantings and, and measurements going in, in, over time that would be useful in terms of actually having numbers to report on how much it costs, what you had to do, what success you had, what the choices, because the soil changes, the slope changes, we know all that, the amount of water flowing per minute changes. And, and so getting the, the naturalized uh, riparian zones would be something with the tree planting with communities as we've been doing now successfully with TRCA for some time. Love to share that kind of thing with Corey <laughs> and others, anybody's interested. <laughs> Alice, I wanted to go back about um, the tree planting with watershed. Um, would you be able to kind of discuss the, the process of that? So like, how do the trees affect um, like how does that how does that play? Well, I, I'm not sure if we have all the measurements because I haven't got any data from the places other than TRCA that we plant with. So the money would be needed to go back in and work uh, and get that new data because we'd love to remeasure that 10 percent. But <laughs> you have to have a special funding of some kind and a mentality of a, of a funder that likes to have the data to see what has been successful. That's where. I think uh, we'd have to go after an individual funding, um, not individual, but some kind of way in which we can get crews back in. Um, I do have TRCA's data and, it's, and now I have an intern analyzing it and I have the video that talks about how they've changed their methodology. But in terms of dollars and cents and uh, that sort of detailed uh, analysis, it's just coming in, it's in the pipeline, I should say, yeah. But um, we know we know that um, land use planning is the key. Because they're not we're not making more land. We may have to have put in corridors of trees between uh, woodlots and or in put boundary plantings around current woodlots. We may have to put some things along um, uh, hedgerows again and have better snowdrop uh, and retain the water. Maybe do some pit. Um, digging and planting along the um, rather iffy agricultural corners of some fields where it may be too damp or something. Uh, we have to think about how we get more trees in the ground to retain the water and the soil. And also as a side effect, produce um, a better libido, not albedo, albedo for, uh, for our planet because the, the glaciers and the, and the ice cap uh, reflect more than the land does and uh, the trees help shade the land and give us uh, food and so on, store carbon. For so we need to look at the numbers. That's the tricky bit. If it's not measured, it doesn't seem to matter. 
and people want numbers. They want widgets. Well, we're not widgets. We don't plant widgets, but we can hopefully develop a standardized evaluation of what the trees contribute to our ecosystem. Some people say, for example, real estate agents, that every a lot can have $10,000 more value with a few trees. Uh, we do know that trees produce um, oxygen so we can breathe and shade so we feel it stay cooler, but how much is the, uh, the carbon worth? Not just to cut the tree down, but to have it stored so if the CO2 is being sucked up by the tree, it's being stored and our atmosphere can clean up a bit. I mean, like your furniture stores carbon, right? And so do trees, but your trees increase uh, if they're kept healthy. So the carbon sequestering of trees is a, becoming, I think, more important. A healthy tree should be managed, managed uh, just like water in the sense that go along with nature, learn from nature, Find what species are successful that can stand the drought or the salt or the heat or whatever it is, and choose the species accordingly for the soil and the slope, etc. And I think we can do an awful lot better in this way of accounting as we go. So I'm hoping that the analysis that uh, Sheridan da Davis campus is, um, we've been working here for five years inventorying campus trees, and now we know how much carbon is stored in those trees and how much they've grown in the last five years. So we're being able to come to the table with some data that will hopefully convince the operations folks, the engineers, Corey, <laughs> who love to play with toys like geothermal and solar panels and triple pane windows, et cetera, et cetera. But forget about the natural assets on the grounds of the campus or wherever they are, headquarters. And uh, because it's not standardized, quote unquote, but I'm suggesting that what we've been doing with our measurement, and this is where I really feel like I should wave a flag and stand on a chair or something, is that we have been measuring this stuff and we now, now need to take that last leap. We've got the data, we've got the measurement protocols, even under COVID we've been planting and measuring. So I think we've got an opportunity here, Corey, to put the two together, especially in riparian zones when they're worried about extreme water events now. Mm -hmm. yeah, I agree. I think it's pretty critical. And we should probably have some more conversations off offline and I can put you in touch with our uh, coordinator of, of conservation lands. Yeah, whatever works, I'm happy to help with our share anything we have, our data and any and our, our procedures, our protocols, all that stuff. And I know that Vince has been very happy with what he's been evolving with the methodology at TRC that last year, I think they planted 15,000 trees, uh, which are not, I think they're one gallon, two gallon pots. They're not just root, bare root, I don't think. So I, mm -hmm. Yeah, and we've been working with him in communities who need a, a canopy. And this is another area where it's not quite watershed management in a way, but there is drainage that has to go into the ground. We know that if you asphalt it, it's not <laughs> gonna have flash flooding. So uh, working with communities who have need to have tree canopy and also have drainage into the ground to recharge the water uh, underground, uh, the groundwater is, is critical. So we've been working at that too. So it doesn't have to be a riparian zone. It can be a community, uh, a condominium, can be headquarters of an office, bioswales, wherever, you know, it doesn't matter, but you have to understand what benefits you get from that kind of planting. You're, uh, you're always two steps ahead of me. Uh, my next question was, uh, why are water and trees so important? It's a simple question, but it's a complex answer. Um, so Corey, would you be able to, to answer uh, why is water so important? Yeah, I, I'd be happy to. And I think you're right. It is a complex question because there's a lot of overlap. Um, and I guess, for me to start talking about water, I think it's important for me to bring people back to grade 10 geography and talking about the hydrologic cycle. Um, <laughs> yeah. And just, you know, that's that's kind of an image that's stuck in most people's heads that, you know, you get rainfall, it hits the ground, some of it goes into the ground and recharges your, your groundwater and your aquifers. Some of it makes its way underground to the streams as base flow and, and upwelling. 
um, and some of it runs off the land as, as runoff to streams, and that's really what causes our flooding. Um, but trees are a critical piece in evapotranspiration, um, you know, using and absorbing that water, not only from the ground and from the roots, but research is showing that just the surface area of a tree has tremendous value in reducing the amount of, of water that gets to the ground as runoff and becomes runoff. Um, especially with broadleaf trees, when you've got um, lots of surface area on, on the leaves, like that, when you add that up over a woodlot or, or a forest, it is a tremendous volume of water that is stored in place, doesn't cause or contribute to downstream flooding. Um, so that that is something to me as an engineer, when I'm looking at hydrology and, and the study of how water flows through the watershed, trees are an absolutely critical piece of, of the picture here. Um, and that reminds me just of the, uh, the Ganaraska watershed. One of the first watershed studies in Ontario was done on the Ganaraska River. Um, and that was before the Conservation Authorities Act came in in, in 46. So one of the main recommendations of that report, besides recommending to the province that conservation authorities be formed to, to support municipalities and, and work with the province to solve some of these flooding and erosion issues, one of the recommendations was creating the Ganaraska Forest to help deal with the erosion um, in that area, as well as some of the downstream flooding that was caused in part because of deforestation. So, so trees are an absolutely critical piece of the picture when it comes to uh, taking care of a watershed and, and managing water on the landscape. Yes, Alice? <laughs> I wanted to say a couple of things. I've got to move to where our charger's located, but so I'll be on the move. But I want to say that I agree 100,000% because leaves actually have a leaf uh, stem, petiole, and it turns the leaf to get the most sun. And so you have an umbrella canopy, which has a drip line, like an umbrella. And uh, that's important to understand that the groundwater then is sought by the young roots reaching for the water, but the, the tree is uh, letting it pound down and move off. And so some of it stays with the leaves, but they are evapotranspiration is huge because it cools the air and provides the clouds that condense later as they cool and rise, uh, rise and cool rather, uh, and come back as precipitation. So it's part of the hydrological cycle is to have a, um, a transpiration from, from the trees, but also from the water surfaces. And some places that have open rivers, uh, channels like California to bring water from wherever are drying up because the rate of transpiration is speeding up and the water supply is going down. Also, I want to mention the aquifer situation and Corey may know more about this in a sense that aquifers out in um, near Guelph are being drained by Nestle and a centiliter was a permission for water taking permits. Is that correct? Well, I know they do have permits to take water for their bottling plants. Yeah. Um, and there are concerns about long-term impacts of that. I've heard, heard that, yeah. Well, I think you have to decide, and, we, and that thing about water management, you have to decide as water levels drop, that you have to decide who's priority, the farmer, the citizen in town, or the company that is employing people. And I think the company has to look, re and check how and investigate and do how they're managing their water inside the plant for more efficiency and whether in fact they should be able to sell bottled water <laughs> because it's a taxpayer that may lose out. Their well may go dry. I know here in Innisfil, they've been digging deeper wells all the time because the agriculture is taking over. <sighs> Boy, um, with uh, with this discussion around uh, around asset management and the importance that um, water and trees both rely on each other, um, could you both speak on the technology that you use while working um, with with watershed or um, with trees in the sense of for natural asset management? Um, Corey, do you wanna do you wanna start? Sure, I can. This topic of asset management is. It's an important one, and it's something that um, 
municipalities and, and various levels of government, I think primarily municipalities though, are, are looking at and, and I guess now have an obligation under, under provincial regulation to, to really document and assess their, their assets, their municipal assets. And that started off with you know roads and bridges and, and sewer systems and, and infrastructure. And that's where the focus was because it's really trying to get a handle on as as this infrastructure ages, you know, do you have a handle as a as a municipality or an organization on the age and the condition of this infrastructure? If it's needing repair, then you need to know um, when do you have to budget for those repairs so that it's it's kept in a, a good condition and serves the people that it, it's supposed to. Be. Um, that's being expanded into the realm of of green infrastructure. Um, yeah. And municipal assets, I think, traditionally, they were probably very engineering heavy and not <laughs> integrated with maybe other parts of the municipality. And that's that's now happening. And this new reg that uh, came out in 2017, it, it specifically makes reference to documenting green infrastructure in your municipality. And that that's a bit of a game changer because what that does, that gets... Uh, these green elements of your community that are playing a, a pretty important role in terms of uh, you know, quality of life to your neighborhoods and, and you know, functions within your river corridors and your stormwater management systems, they're now getting a place on the balance sheet. They're actually getting a value. Um, and that, that is really, uh, it really is a game changer because I think people are now seeing that the real true value of, of recognizing and, and uh, maintaining and protecting and investing in these types of assets. And one of the things that I guess, um, as, a, as an engineer that deals with stormwater, one of the places where these two worlds of trees and water overlap in a municipal setting is, is street trees. Um, there's, I remember seeing a presentation from a fellow a few years ago who his company specializes in tree pits. So basically building a, a cage underneath the sidewalk and, and maybe the edge of the road to give a tree enough room for its roots. And he said, you know, you need 25 to 30 cubic meters of area for a, a healthy tree to have roots and, and room to grow. That way they're not pushing up the sidewalk and, and going into utilities and things like that. Um, but I remember him saying that a street tree is, is the only municipal asset in a right-of-way, a road right-of-way, that increases in value over time. All other assets depreciate. Yep. And I think that, just hearing that, that was so refreshing to think of, you know, wow, we've really been undervaluing our street trees in, in uh, you know, in looking at assets in a, a municipality. So, um, I think the fact that it's on the balance sheet is it really is like I say it's a game changer but um, it's going to what it's doing it's creating conversations and an integration between departments within a municipality and even within partner uh, organizations to help document these things and, and get them into um, planning and, and guidelines like engineering standards those types of things so it's it's an exciting time for that because been a long time coming yeah uh, I, okay, um, okay. <laughs> i want to um, follow through uh, uh follow up uh corey because you've hit on a bunch of things that on my mind uh the the uh, mm, water management includes wetlands right mm -hmm. and uh some sometimes the developers think that they can replace a wetland or replace a bog and uh, that and sell bog, sell peat, which they're doing in some, some counties. So a very big part now is is that consideration because we know the recharge and holding of that water in a bog or wetland is critical. Those are the kidneys of the watershed. And uh, that was one point I wanted to make is that uh, we haven't really appreciated the functions of the wetland and the bogs. And now we're uh, looking at the disappearance of the boreal forest, or maybe it's moving north. It's even it's coming to attention because we're getting uh, methane bubbles and all sorts of things in the lakes and whatnot. The other thing I wanted to mention that um, 
fits into what you're thinking here is that uh, I think the conservation authorities were forced to draw um, new floodplain uh, maps, including the carbon change projections for every watershed. And I'm not sure whether they have done that or if they have, they're afraid to publish it because of lawsuits. I know one one com one CA that is was afraid they had done it all, and were well they were just expecting lawsuits or everybody sitting on a floodplain and built their house there. So that's but that's happening in Florida for sure. That's a good example of for example some of these uh, oceanside luxury places. We saw that building collapse in Florida, for example. So the insurance companies are going to play a role here. Uh, just touching on a few things like that, because um, I'm just um, concerned about the other thing is that the street trees, I know in some jurisdictions, municipalities, they count on 10 years and they pull the tree because they haven't any more root system to place to grow. Some of these places are um, experimenting with silver cells and uh, they're, they're sort of a old fashioned milk crate sort of thing in the ground so that the tree can be planted and have a rectangle of roots, let's say a cute rectangular shape. And I'm not sure, I'm working with a little bit, beginning to work with the city of Mississauga boat thing. They seem to be enamored with street cells, silva cells, and I'm wondering if they got the right size and have they tested it anywhere, where's the proof? Because I was around when they started developing those in the university and testing them. And I wasn't too impressed at that time, and I don't know what the track record is. But I do know that street trees uh, do add value and should be inventoried and species chosen carefully. Um, one of my connections is a um, uh, landscaper, designer, works all the time in the field uh, with clients, and she talked about um, a species of tree she loves because it's drought and salt resistant, doesn't get too big and it's lovely to look at and smell and whatever. It's an ivory silk lilac. I don't know if I've ever seen one, but she swears by them. They survived all these nasty conditions. That's the kind of thing we should be looking at because it has answers a lot of the questions we have to face in street trees. Maybe not there, maybe on your front yard instead, who knows? But I think these are the very working with people who've been in the business planting under different conditions. So we get something that's able to survive uh, on these streets where we need the shade and the roadsides need the shade, not because we, we think about the Grand Allais in Europe where they have trees arching over the whole road providing shade and a cooler environment to, to walk or drive or bike in. And there in Germany, they have a Grand Allais here or there and they are replacing every third tree now because they're aging out. We have to know that too that uh, we have to think about that. So um, uh, inventorying street trees, knowing what species are where is something we're taking on as a program called Tree Trackers now, where individuals can do that. And with a proper app and training, well, not, like, not much training, but anyway. So new things happening for us to help people who want to measure and monitor and maintain and plan around trees is where we're at with communities and trying different programs and different people. Uh, well, I have another question for uh, for you both, and I'll start with you, Alice. Um, how can asset management spread the importance of these wonderful elements of nature and emphasize the risk of climate change? Um, so we have discussed it a little bit, um, but like what what can be done to, okay. to mitigate? Well, yeah, a good question. And I think trees can help a lot. Uh, not only holding the soil, the water in the soil. And, and I know when Mississauga, the, the people out there, um, or Peel, found out, maybe the CBC found out that the uh, proper water management with bioswales and um, uh, pl proper plantings uh, held the flood peak back five hours. So that gives people time to get their goodies out of the basement. Uh, if they, and even smarter, if it's a flash flood, uh, then you have a grab and grab and go bag, which you prepared and have right by the door in the coat in the coat cupboard, ready to go with all the things that keep you for over 72 hours. That grab and go bag, we have a list of that on our website. But that's one thing is that we need to value the preparedness and understanding of what's going to happen when there's a, a big downpour, a, a cell burst downburst, 
in your area. And you can't handle that. That's too extreme or too much. You've seen it many times. The other thing that's happening right now is when the snowpack melts. And you must be getting ready for that in Ganaraska too. The snowpack's going to melt soon, starting already here and there. And when it lets go, you're going to have flooding over the sill in many, many places. And they'll all be upset. The insured losses uh, in Ontario are huge with flooding on different rivers like down around Ottawa. And not only that, we have ice jams where they, it breaks up and jams in big chunks. And then we have flooding even more. Also, you have log jams when there's steep slopes and logs have been, trees have been cut and the trees aren't holding the soil up in BC. They proved by experiment that those lands where the soil was burnt and, and when it got a rainfall, a good one, that rushed the dirt down to the, jammed the logs and, and debris, not only the logs, but the debris down in the creeks and were flooding there, but also the fish couldn't get anywhere. So that was a big loss for tourism too. So there's a major interaction between trees and, and water. Not only the bears that eat salmon and shit in the woods to nourish the trees, but that's, which is very part of a cycle out there and where the salmon run. They want to come back to the same water to, to lay their eggs and, and raise their young. young. Well, they don't raise them, but they <laughs> let them grow, I should say. But we know that there's a huge interaction between nature, uh, animals, and plants with water. That has to be a cycle all the way around. Everybody needs water, of course. And uh, how we use it is really, and how we plan to keep it. So we have it for use. Look at all the money and waste of time that's gone into boil water advisories up there and burning fuel to boil water in the north because they haven't got access to decent clean, cleaning water, clean water, drinking water. Well, that's because they're in a floodplain with creeks and bogs. And how do you build fresh water infrastructure? Very difficult. You have to wait for the ice bridge or the boat once a year to bring you in enough materials. And then you have to build the place with labor of some kind, training them as they go probably. And then you have to train the people to run the place and maintain it over time because you're so isolated. So every one of these water install installations up north in the, in the barrens, if you like, of Northern Ontario is very expensive. It's a long, long um, road because the rivers are not clean anymore. That's uh, that's amazing. Um, I think I'm so grateful for you both because I think you're you're showing so many people experienced or new um, how essential these these services are and these elements are. Um, Corey, do you have anything to add um, about uh, how um, asset management can help um, spread the importance of these elements? Yeah, I, I would I would add that. Um, the principle of having green assets and green infrastructure on the balance sheet, like I mentioned before, it really is a game changer because once it does have a value, it changes how we see it and how we plan our communities and how development is done. Um, you know, it may impact decisions about, you know, um, you know, how, how woodlots are viewed, like, um, some woodlots are protected because they provide a lot of environmental and ecological functions, but ones that aren't significant, there's really little protection for that. And if there's a value of carbon uh, sequestration and, and mitigation that's added to that, it may change how we see them. Um, but I think what this will hopefully do is, is really help us rethink and change the paradigm of how we develop our communities. Yeah. Um, right now, stormwater management is seen as a waste product. You know, when you look at a catch basin on the street, that's carefully designed by an engineer to get the water out of there as quickly as possible. And if we were to see stormwater as a resource, now that we're looking at the green infrastructure dif differently, we're going to be designing our sites and our, our um, you know, our communities in a very different way that we're going to landscape features into these areas to hold on to that water, to get it back in the ground and um, you know, play a, a bigger role in the hydrologic cycle. 
that in turn has benefits from reducing downstream flooding. And I think just to touch on um, some stuff that Alex had mentioned, the key word nowadays is resiliency. Yeah. And I know <laughs> um, identifying flood hazards is the top priority in Ontario's flooding strategy. That's what the province has said. You have to identify a certainty where are the areas that are going to flood? And conservation authorities have been doing that for over 60 years, ever since Hazel, Hurricane Hazel. Um, and I don't think a lot of people realize that. The problem is there's not a sustainable funding source to update this mapping. And you know we don't have maps that show the impacts of climate change. We're, we're well aware that we need to do that. And I think um, you know the province is developing standards and a, and a system of I guess systematic approach to do that, but those guidelines haven't been released yet. Um, but the other benefit of, of updating these mapping, these maps and, and this uh, information is that to do that, we need robust models, computer models, and that's looking at the hydrology of your watershed, looking at a, a, a hydraulic model of a river system. And once you have these models created, you can test them, you can do different situations. You can, you can say, well, what if we converted this area to forest? What does that do to our downstream flooding? So I don't think um, a lot of folks, and I think this would include political leaders, I don't think they've maybe connected all the dots on the value of updating floodplain mapping and funding that properly. Um, in our watershed, we have some maps that are from 1975, and I have a box of computer punch cards and that's my model. I don't have a digital version of that model today and I have to recreate it, but I don't have funding to do that. Um, so there's a lot of, I think, catch up to take conservation authorities um, in, into the 21st century and into the digital, digital age from paper to, to digital. Um, once that's done, you can test climate change situations and scenarios and really make good decisions so that when money is available for mitigation options, you can figure out how to spend those dollars in the best way. Um, so I know that's kind of a winded answer, but <laughs> I think it's yeah. very important and um, it's worth understanding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, so uh, in order to uh, uh, help this along a bit, and I have a wonderful way of, of getting it, a message out there, which will, what we need to do. And and I'm, one of the problems I see to add to this dollar value is that we don't put trees in the transportation budget for the ministry. There's, a, I think, just like street trees, road trees, highway trees that can, and bioswales, uh, are along, we've done not too badly, but we love concrete and asphalt, and that's causing the flooding and the black ice, right? So I think one of the moves that have to be made in my mind is to put tree plantings and design into the transportation portfolio for road building. And look at lighter colors of asphalt so that we're not getting heating up in the summer, making ruts for people to have accidents on now because they're gonna have higher temperatures. They're gonna to have to change their mix. And one of the things that they have to figure out is make it lighter, but that means that they have to drain it better too. So for winter. So uh, because winter's getting shorter, right? Ice bridges are very short lived these days, taking supplies north, we know that. We know that from living around the Lake Ontario, for heaven's sakes, yes. And uh, so that's one thing I think really would move the needle as well, because we love to build highways. I think we should stop building them, but many ways we should put trees along them, not just the highway of heroes, which is not even monitored, I don't believe, in terms of how the, which trees are doing wetter and, and how much they grow and that kind of thing. I'd love to be able to do 10% of that, but uh, tag and measure. But the valuing of the wood sequestered is another whole look way of looking at things. If we know that different species sequester wood at different rates, grow grow the stem of the tree, uh, then we can look at that as another factor in making choices about species that deal with the salt and the drought and so on and the, and the, and the warming temperatures. We're having maples that are 
are under stress because of the hot summers now. They're getting black mold, you know, on the leaves of black spots. It won't hurt them, but it doesn't look pretty and it doesn't go away. So there's lots of things happening with new insects coming in. And we've planted historically Norway maples that have very little biodiversity. If you shake a Norway maple, there's hardly anything drops out. But if you shake a regular maple, a sugar maple, you have tons of insects coming down. So the whole uh, cycle, as you talked about the hyological cycle, there's a cycle of life that's going on in those trees as well. So uh, lots of considerations to cross over and work together water and trees. I think uh, a major, major uh, factor in, in planning and homes and, and these dead end streets or cul-de-sacs and things like that. They could be taking on, and the hydro line is another area. Corey, I'd love to have hydro planting along their perimeters of their hydro ways, lots of trees that not don't interfere. The height is designed, it's a chosen. And meadow ways, instead of mowing grass or letting grass grow, put in wildflowers for the pollinators and put in trees that are going to cool the environment and let the dead end streets that butt into those hydro lines put in a parquet for all the trail walkers along the hydro line. Things like that are not going to be majorly expensive because you'll have citizens involved. But the planners need to get their act together to help us and get it's not, it's a 10 year plan. You know, planning is like 10 year cycle, right? By the time the developer holds the land as a bookmark till like you see the sign that you better put your input in, it's too late. They've been at it for 10 years and got their plans all drawn up. So we have to work very early now. The pressure's on if we're going to um, be resilient with these um, uh, major events, more frequent, more extreme, more often. And uh, that's, that's the key. Resilience is built, uh, if you build it in with a preparedness, uh, you have a shorter gap before you bounce back. It's that gap that uh, it's, it builds, they call it the resilience uh, dividend. It's a really a, a book on it. That she's a, a woman who wrote it, uh, actually researched the flooding after um, New York was there, had a big flood, and how it bounced back the first time, how it prepared for the second time, much better result. They were ready. Uh, and now that's happening in other parts of the United States. I don't know if it's happening here yet. I think we're just be trying to pay our insurance policies and restore our homes, but are you restoring them properly? Maybe you should put your ground floor up a, up a level or make sure the bottom floor is not populated by all your furniture and things like that. In Australia, they put houses up on stilts and built one, one uh, small room or one piece on blocks on a, on a concrete pad as a hurricane shelter and built their house on top of that. But underneath the um, deck, if you like, the house and the deck, they, they actually had their uh, changing rooms for a pool or whatever. They had their washer, dryer. So it was all expendable. Yeah. And that's maybe how we have to think. I know they do in Costa Rica, some places like that along the, the beaches. They put their houses, and other countries put their houses on stilts, and especially when they know there's animals underneath that, that uh, need to be, get, have uh, warm up the house. That's what the Norwegians did, and then sort of the Philippines, so on. They built their houses on stilts for the animals to have shelter and help and heat their homes. So we have to think about other ways of planning and building, and uh, maybe the, the, um, all the electricity generators and all those kinds of things with water management should never be on the ground floor of the basement. They should be on the top floor of your air conditioning and, and unit should be on the top of the house, not in the uh, other places. And so the, the um, generator, the backup plans for big commercial buildings should never be uh, at ground level. It should be up in the second floor or the third floor so the easy maintenance and away from the flooding. Look what happened downtown when that blew up when the uh, um, intersection there with a big box for terminals and generators and so on. They were warned about that. Toronto was warned about all this flooding underground infrastructure and they, they still lost it. And the culverts are built too small. We know that up at Dufferin when it blew the Dufferin Street one there uh, a few years ago, that culvert was too big, too small, and, and all the culverts really should be read, and bridges have to be redesigned. 
for the higher flood, peak floods that are going to happen very much more often. Anyway, that's my background with working with meteorologists and climate change impact people at the Environment Canada when I first started into this stuff. But you've lived it, lived it at Burlington. Now you know. Yeah, I, I've seen it firsthand. And I, I think um, one of the key things that came out of that was, you know, identifying the, the flood hazard areas, the floodplains, the hurricane hazel floodplains. And that's the standards that all conservation authorities in Southern Ontario are bound by is mapping out where would the flooding be if we had hurricane hazel again over that particular watershed. And so that's what our mapping is based on. Um, when you get up further north, it's the Timmins storm. So it's, it's, yeah. it's different, but um, I think the key strategy in Ontario, and I should mention Ontario and Quebec are the only provinces in Canada that really have policy frameworks and, and supporting regs to keep new development out of the floodplain. Um, wow. That's why you're seeing flooding in new subdivisions out in other parts of, of Canada is because they don't have the same framework that we do here to protect people and property. And I think when you map out a, a flood hazard, we shouldn't be developing in it. We can you know, have setbacks and, and develop adjacent, but new development should not be going in a flood hazard. It's a different story for legacy development that's already there. Then you work with people to make those areas safer uh, and it may be worst case scenario is you relocate some of those high risk um, concerns, but um, new development should not be going in the floodplain in any way, shape or form in yeah. my view. Yeah, I agree. Oh yeah. But you know, uh, my experience with my, my buddies from Environment Canada days, uh, they, they did reports predicting what was gonna happen in Toronto, predicting what was gonna happen in Calgary, fabulous reports, ignored because nobody would put money up front Prevention is cheaper, but nobody wants to buy it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And that's where the problem is, the old expression of an ounce of prevention. Well, that's truer now than it has ever been, I think, with yeah. these extreme weather events. One story that my friend told me was uh, they want to put a new bridge in one of the near one of the villages. In, I don't know what, I think it was Dufferin County, someplace in there. And, and uh, the Reeves said, well, I, I paddled down there this morning and I put up my hand and my paddle and I got under the bridge. <laughs> Wasn't peak flood. So he was he was dictating the height of the new bridge because he paddled under and put up his paddle. That's really engineering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's what you have to watch. These local guys who figure they know it all because they lived there all their lives. You've got an uphill battle to overcome some of those old uh, thoughts. And attitudes because if they unless they've lived through a downburst in uh, can be water can be wind too downbursts of wind we lost ships that way mm -hmm. right so anyway just a fascinating time to live where we have the answers we just have to get it through people's heads that we can do it and that's uh, hopefully the hope of uh what we can we can get out of these you bet um Thank you both of you so, so much. Um, I am gonna pass it along to my colleagues because um, I know that they're probably um, itching to ask their questions. So I'll, I'll pass it along to John first and then and then we'll, we'll give it to Gigi. Oh, John, you're muted. Yeah, that was fantastic. Thanks. And uh, just to reiterate, Heidi as well, great job. Um, so I'll keep it brief. Um, Sustainable Coburg has partnered with the town of Coburg and the Ganaraska region taking the lead on this uh, intact. Intact insurance is supporting the municipal climate resiliency grant program. And one of the things that this will do is uh, help the Ganaraska region update its, its mapping, inundation mapping and using digital technology like the flow gauges to measure real time the levels of water coming into the bioswale to mitigate flooding at a particular creek that impacts our drinking water. And that's all interesting work. So the question I have, and I had this question, well, let me just put it out there. The satellite imagery is getting much more detailed and resolution. 
big companies, uh, big tech are using, like Google Earth, for example, has all this detailed information. And then once they get these maps that are updated, they can begin to extract or monetize that data as they build out these broadband networks, the 5G and the Internet of Things. So I'm just wondering, how do we get politicians to think about um, having the developers pay for growth, but also the digital companies, the big tech companies pay for their growth and do no harm in how that growth impacts nature where we live? It's a big question. I don't expect an answer, but maybe just a reflection. Corey. Oof, that is a big question. <laughs> um, I thought where you're you're going to go is if we're doing mapping, um, you know, and, and defining flood hazards, then that might have implications for insurance companies and and trying to offer flood insurance for people in those high risk areas. Um, but I I think it raises a good point, and I think those are questions that we're going to have to struggle with for for the foreseeable future. Um, but yeah, you raise a, a number of great points. I, I don't really know how to answer that, to be honest, John. Okay, let me take a crack at it. Uh, I'm, what I'm thinking about immediately is uh, we have golf courses that are just placeholders for developers. We know that because the golfing population is dropping off anyway, but so, there's only one or two people who hold all the golf course ownerships. Yep. And just like the... If developers want in and put houses there, I think that very careful planning with respect to watershed management, because most many of those golf courses have water sources that they use to sprinkle all their lawns. So I would think right away that is something or is a source of income that possibly that the developers are holding this cheaply for a long time. They bought it cheap, they're holding it. And if they want to develop, they're going to have to pay for the flood line, the updated with climate change projections just like the environmental, as part of the environmental assessment. That's who, I don't know who pays environmental assessment. Maybe they do, I can't remember. But I think that's one small place to start because these, and also if they're going to build a low impact, what do they call that, uh, where the water stays on the house property or the building property and they get a break because they've got uh, the ground being more absorbent and less asphalt or whatever. Uh, and, and there's water um, being very carefully conserved within the home uh, or the building, uh, multi, multi family dwellings or whatever. That, that, that whole thing, the downspout and all that kind of stuff has to be re examined, blue roofs, whatever, not green roofs necessarily, maybe green roofs, depending. That all has to be in their plan, environmental assessed, so that we have the water management piece in there and the tree cover and the tree cover. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it's important to look at what you're thinking about growing as a planner in your development of your city or town and how you're going to regulate that because you have big box stores asphalting everywhere. What are they doing to buy that? piece of property how are they maintaining their water quality that's going out from the salted they have to have some reservoirs and where the salt is drained and out and recycled for the roads or something they've got to be much smarter on how they're using water as they're asking you to pay big bucks and getting away with low taxes really for their development uh, and I think the cities normally put out a dollar 40 or dollar 30 for every dollar the developer puts in so I think this is this has got to stop. Yeah. If you want to make money over the life of a building, you've got to pay more up front or pay more annually. You can't just use your free air and free water, let cheap water supply and cheap sewers and be supported all the time. And you're making money to buy another piece of property at, 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 at too much. You're making too much of a profit. Yeah. It's not, you know, people are not getting that much more money in their pay, pay home check. I know we want to have development. I know, but it has to be incredibly well managed. In Germany, in order for you to change the landscape as a developed person who wants to build a house, you have to pay the surveyors a lot of money and it takes a long time to get permission to do anything because they're not going to let the infrastructure, you know, the building and its planning and its 
whatever it is, interfere with what they want the natural assets to be. And that's another whole area because the natural assets are not being accounted for in these built environments. They've got to count the tree contribution to sucking up the CO2 and other pollutants. You've got to pay for that in your billing of the developer. If they're not putting enough trees on the property and maintaining those over the long haul, then they should be charged more or put the trees in the ground. They have to work together to, to really get the water cycle working for the town, for the people who live there. They need those comforts of shade, cooling effects, water retention, carbon sequestering, all of those things we're not valuing. And the water management team should be working with the ecologists, biologists, whoever, I don't care what name they have, but they're people who know what trees do and the price it might be charged to, over time. Because as you say, trees appreciate and, and buildings depreciate. Yeah, the, uh, Corey puts uh, the, consult, the Ontario Environmental Registry consultation documents in there. That's sort of what we were, Heidi's project was, it's policy and how do we use digital tools to uh, be more effective at engaging the community in co that consultation. So, so that's, that's very good. And do you want me to just touch on that? Charlie? Yeah, please, please. So what I put in the chat there, and you can share these, Heidi, in whatever form you feel appropriate, but right now the province has released on the environmental registry for public comment and consumption is, uh, there's a, a number of things. Um, there's a document that is dealing with um, low impact development in Ontario. and, and they tried to release this a few years ago, I think in 2017, but it, it kind of got shut down after the election. Um, they've reissued this discussion, not only a discussion paper, but um, the low impact development guidance document for Ontario. And, and low impact development is basically looking at kind of what we talked about before, looking at stormwater as a, a potential resource. So getting water back into the ground, storing it on your site, using it to water vegetation on your on your site as a you know, whether it's a you know a new plaza or development or a or a subdivision or a condominium, whatever it is. And so this is the first time that the province is providing leadership and direction in this particular area. Uh, like Toronto Region Conservation Authority, Credit Valley, and Lake Simcoe have really been leading low impact development best management practices for Ontario. Um, kudos to them, but the province is now releasing this document for input and they have um, criteria in there that they want to achieve and it's, you know, storing in the order of 25 to 30 millimeters of, of rain on a property. So as, a, as part of your de design concept, you must show how you satisfy storing that inch of rain plus on your site and not, not letting it go in the conventional sense where it just hits the ground and goes into the sewer. It's looking at it as a resource and treating it that way. So that's, that's a game changer. If that becomes part of the development process in, in Ontario, that is a game changer and that helps us get back into restoring the hydrologic cycle. The other thing I wanna mention is they also have a public uh, consultation period for a discussion paper that's called um, Municipal Wastewater and Stormwater Management in Ontario. And it's looking at, you know, those, I guess not blurring those lines between wastewater and stormwater and um, looking at reuse options, um, you know, making better use of how we use water in Ontario. So it's, it's, it's really encouraging to see this because it's getting this, discussion out into the public forum to say, how can we do this better? Um, you know, how do we manage stormwater going into the future and, and integrate that with green infrastructure and, and just green development? Do we have to change the policies within the Water Resources Act? Um, how do we promote reuse of water in Ontario? So there's a lot of stuff that's covered in this, in this discussion paper. So I'd encourage you to read that get the word out, get people to comment on it and, and give feedback to the province because we've been waiting a while for this kind of, yeah. um, you know, opportunity. 
So. Yeah. Um, uh, well, are they going? Do you think? And I haven't read it, of course. But are they going to put in compulsory or mandated low, uh, full flush toilets, for example? Are they putting in tax breaks for those who do better, uh, have better lawns, or or retain more water available? I mean, possibly retain more water because they've got more um, greenery on their property, uh, yeah. whether it's uh, grass or wildflowers or trees or whatever. But the point is. Uh, those reduction in taxes, if you have water retention, have cut down the water the sewage, um, and and uh, that's really a critical. And also in the home, where is the gray water going? Where is this run? Can you not run a toilet on gray water? It seems to me we're wasting good drinking water down every time you flush. <laughs> in Iceland, they geothermal heat water from the steam from the, or at least the water from their um, glacier vents uh, is put through um, a series of insulated pipes to the local cities, villages, towns, whatever. And in the capital, Reykjavik, they uh, step it down so it can be a hot water tank in your home. Then they step that down to be let out under your sidewalk, for example, out of your home so it's not iced up. And then they like, also do that for the municipality so that you don't have ice forming on those sidewalks and you're just using the waste heat. We know that heat is the most waste, the waste is most wasted form of energy, period. So anything that you can get heat out of the water is gonna save you electricity. And uh, so maybe pumping it around in your house with gray water or something like that. I think the design of home designs uh, is really critical here. Yeah, yeah. So I would like to um, acknowledge that those comments are exactly uh, why we are engaging in this uh, series because we have an election coming up Mm -hmm. And it seems that there are many people who are still in uh, isolation mode with regards to the pandemic. And our hope is that we can at least bring to the table uh, some knowledgeable information to uh, our constituents here so that when we have our all candidates forum, that these individuals will already have some knowledge of what it is that they should be expecting of their political representatives. There are 440 municipalities in Ontario. That is not a small amount. Mm -hmm. And what they need as well, not only the pandemic is a stressor, it's all also the affordable housing situation, which yeah. is a stressor. So we have then on top of it, when people, especially in Coburg, it's, it was extremely upsetting to me to read uh, our, our local newspaper this morning to see the emphasis that is only on affordability without looking at the things that we have just, as you people have just discussed here this, this afternoon. And that is affordability is not just about money, it's about what you value. And we need to value more than money. We need to value those natural assets. We need to value doing things differently, using gray water, using permeable concrete, using different methodologies. But our population has been so inundated with personal stresses, mental um, health issues, environmental and, and mental health issues are copacetic. So we know that our planet is in stress and we are in stress. So if we want to bring ourselves back to health, we need to bring our planet back to health. And we need to bring how we live with this planet back to symbiosis, back to a balance. And all those things are about knowledge. All those things are about having access to people who are completely invested only in doing what will be of benefit, not to get votes, not to make money, simply to do what 
we as a community here in Sustainable Coburg know is going to bring about the uh, balance and the sustainability of a lifestyle that um, is, is, is a, a responsibility in every which way, whether it's waste management, whether it's water waste management, whether it's how you use electricity, where you get electricity, but we want to make it accessible to when when unfortunately <laughs> I I'm I'm very passionate about this and sometimes I scare people away <laughs> so I don't want to do that I want to make it that they know that they have a certain amount of control because in the last two years it's felt like we haven't had any control yeah. uh, and people are fighting against, against mandates and saying it's my freedom and it's this and that that is an argument and a debate that I would love to get into, but right now the focus needs to be on how do how are we doing things that are hurtful and how can we do it better? And we know how to do it better, right? Alice, you know that. We know how to do it better. We just need to get that word out and get support from the community to elect those officials that also will want to do it better through affordable housing, it can also be sustainable. It can also use the natural environment. There are so many ways to look at solutions that people have not really delved into and we wanna shine a light on those. So we are so appreciative for your um, <laughs> shining that light in, in, your, in your wonderful way and uh, for Heidi to uh, have that, uh, that focus and that um, ability to draw these things uh, out of uh, both of you. Much so I'd, you. I'd like to give Heidi the last word and maybe Heidi just talk about the design jam idea that we have in mind. Yeah, so we're, uh, we're having a design jam with uh, the local high school in, in Coburg. And so the question we have that we're, we're hoping to pose to them is, um, how do we manage our assets to support um, sustainable development um, while mitigating climate change? Hmm. Right. Well, I'm going to say one thing that to Gigi and everybody, including you, Heidi, especially you, if we don't involve the users or potential users in the design, we don't get it done we won't have a satisfactory answer. The problem has been in schoolyards, anywhere we're planting trees, if the people who live there, who work there, who play there are not involved, affordable housing design, from taps to bathrooms, clean how you clean a tap, how you design the tap for easier cleaning. I mean, like they get simple. I used to argue about bathroom tap design because it was terrible to clean. You needed a bloody toothbrush. So, so, <laughs> So it, it, it need participation. Any place we planted trees and had communities and students plant, we never had vandalism. Once you go in there and dump a tree in a schoolyard and, and the kids are not involved, teachers not involved, custodians not involved, the school board dumps it in because we need to plant trees, blah, blah, blah. You have vandalism. And now that's what's in Ottawa. They're, we're not involved in the decision-making from the top down, they're tired, so they're rebelling. And that's what's gonna happen. And if you don't bring them in in the very beginning of the planning, process, have a, more minds around the table from the users from different perspectives, you'll get a much better product. Right. Everybody will be happy. Some of the common housing buildings in BC, for example, with multiple ages, multiple sizes, common this and common that to everybody live together in a happy smaller space, is we need to look at models that are working in countries that don't have as much land to waste as we, they think we do. We don't have much land to waste because we're sitting on all the agricultural land next to the watersheds or on the watersheds. All the good farmland has been planted on by housing. That's how we were developed this country. They landed their canoes or their ships and went upstream and then we put in mills and then we put in villages. And now we're living on those best soil. So we've got to be smarter. We've got to plan and participate in the plan, have people participate from all walks of life. The biggest matrix you can call in is a stakeholder meeting before you launch a plan. Right. You've got to get them in at the ground floor. That's it. That's, that's the only right route to success at the community level anywhere 
if you don't have a classroom of kids buying into what your lesson plan is, you're in trouble. So the same thing works in communities and governments of all levels. Right now, this two billion trees program they want in 10 years. If they don't have communities planting, they're not going to get it done unless they bring in the military. Well, they're not going to plant very well. They don't know how. <laughs> they don't even know how to mulch properly. Most people don't know how to mulch. They mulch volcanoes and not flat donuts. <laughs> and they don't, and they dig in the in the bloody um, clay and put the tree in there, and it's never going to be able to get out of it. It's going to strangle itself in the clay over years. There's so many things that have to go into the knowledge base that Gigi mentioned. Gigi mentioned. But also, you've got to bring the people to the table. And I warn you, Corey, if you're not doing that in your watershed, you're going to be in deep doo-doo. <laughs> no, I agree with you. That's the approach we were taking, too. It's engagement. But absolutely. And you've got to have people who know how to do that. Not the pros, because the local leaders, because you bring in the pros and the consultants are going to charge you in our league, and they don't know the situation where you live. That's right. You've got to have local leaders at the table all faiths, all sizes, shapes, colors, and ages, all the things. And you'll have the best product and everybody be proud. Mm -hmm. You might even win medals. <laughs> Heidi, can you win us a medal? I can try. I can try for sure. But, well, uh, I think we've got uh, a great group of, of people here around this table. And that's the kind of conversation that's going to take you in a winning way with the young people like yourself, Heidi, leading the path for us older guys who might often uh, offer experience from the mistakes we've made and, and, and the observations we've been living long enough to make, like Corey with his Burlington flood and me with a few others. I had students who were, whose parents were lost their homes at Thistleton Collegiate and the Hurricane Hazel at um, Hong Humber at Islington. They brought in pictures and showed me. And so we went down and looked and found the old railway or the old bridge ties. So there's experience in your community, the wisdom of the community. You've got to build on that. No other way out of this mess. Well, I think that's a perfect note to end on. And I want to thank you both so, so much for, for sharing some of your wisdom and taking the time out to not only teach me, but the viewers. Um, I will, in the, in the caption below this video, I will add the links that, that Corey sent. Um, and, uh, and thank you guys so, so much. You're welcome. Thank you. We've had fun. We've had fun. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, good to see you all.